Good morning. It's good to be with you all this morning. Welcome to this morning's Adult Education Forum. It's good to be with you here in the recreation room and also those who are gathered on the live stream. My name is Alexandra Jacob. I think I've met everyone here in the room, but perhaps not everyone on the live stream this morning. I'm Associate Pastor for Families, Youth, and Children here at Westminster. It's fun for me to be in this adult ed space because I'm almost always otherwise occupied during this hour, so I don't think I've ever actually spent a full adult ed hour, so I'm grateful to be with you all this morning. I am here because this series on trans allyship in the church has been co-sponsored by Families, Youth, and Children, and we have our high schoolers here. Shout out to Victor and Shay <laughs> this morning, um, and also with West Connect, Young Adults, and Adult Education. I am grateful to Austin Hartke, who's here to lead the third of three sessions that he's led here at Westminster this May. This final session is about trans allyship in church congregations, and I'm eager for us to receive Austin's wisdom. If you've been to one of Austin's previous sessions, you have heard this, but Austin is the author of Transforming, the Bible and the Lives of Transgender Christians, and is the founder and director of the Transmission Ministry Collective, which is an online community dedicated to the spiritual care and formation and leadership potential of trans and gender expansive Christians. So I invite you as you hear Austin's presentation to be thinking of any questions that you might have and I'll help to moderate the question and answer portion at the end of the presentation. So welcome Austin. Hello, friends. It's great to be back with you again this morning. Um, this is our, our third session together, so I'm excited to be here and excited to talk about kind of um, now that we've talked about trans folks in the Bible and uh, maybe you were around for the Exploring Gender Diversity talk that was, gosh, uh, some months ago now. Um, uh, we kind of get into the question of like, what do we do with all this information? Um, and so if you weren't able to be here at previous sessions, that's totally okay. Uh, hopefully um, I'll be, I'll have information here that will make sure that you're kind of up to speed. But um, uh, we're gonna start out just reviewing a couple of things that I've mentioned in previous sessions, just to make sure everybody's on the same page in terms of what we're talking about and the language that I'm gonna be using, and then we'll get into it. So, um, if you remember, this is kind of the model that I've been using the past these past couple of uh, sessions together to talk about what gender is. And I've talked about how gender has three parts that all sort of are interconnected and affect each other. So the first part is your body, which has to do with your internal and external reproductive organs, your chromosomes, your hormone levels, and your brain matter. All those things that have to do with your body and gender, that's that first section there. Your gender identity is who you know yourself to be. So your internal self-perception and experience of being female, male, both, or neither. And then your gender expression is the way that you show your gender to others through clothing, hair, mannerisms, voice, etc., which have gendered values in your particular time and place. Uh, taking on specific gender roles can also be part of our gender expression. So we've talked about how these three things uh, are sort of how they interact, how they're interconnected. Um, and so I, I bring this up because I'm going to be giving you some definitions that are common in trans communities today. And it's helpful to have this background so that you know what I'm talking about when I say like your gender identity, you know which part of this I'm talking about here. So I often use the language of trans and gender expansive people when I'm talking about these communities. Um, uh, while most folks among us are cisgender, meaning they have a gender identity that matches their assigned sex, between 0.6 and 2% of people in the U.S. are transgender, meaning they have a gender identity that is different from their assigned sex. So cis and trans are both Latin prefixes. Cis means um, across from, and uh, or, sorry, uh, cis means on the same side, and trans means across from or beyond, like transatlantic, for instance, is an example of that prefix. So cis and trans are just two um, ways of talking about are your gender identity and your assigned sex kind of lined up, or are they different from each other? That's what those prefixes mean. 
So we often uh, use trans or transgender as an umbrella term to encompass many different kinds of gender diverse identities. Uh, some folks really like this idea of like a trans umbrella of like calling like trans or transgender using that as an umbrella term for lots of different identities. Other people are not so thrilled with that sort of umbrella and and maybe feel very strongly about their particular identity and how it is different. So you might meet some people who use some of these terms that I'm going to introduce here um, who are like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I feel like I'm under the trans umbrella and that's a helpful way to think about it. And other people are like, no, that doesn't actually work for me in my particular identity. So knowing that that's true. Um, I sometimes use the phrase gender expansive, or we talk about gender diversity, um, to talk about these different kinds of gender identities and expressions uh, for people that don't match, uh, whose gender identity and expression don't match their assigned sex. So that's why I often use the language of trans and gender expansive. So let's talk about some of the common uh, sort of uh, identities within this big community of people. Um, there are folks like myself, so a transgender man is someone who is assigned female at birth but knows themselves to be male, so that would be me. There are transgender women who are people who are assigned male at birth but know themselves to be female. And while for a long time we kind of assumed like all trans people would fall into one of these two boxes <laughs> because of this thing called the gender binary, which is a thing in our society where we assume everybody falls into either a male or female box. So we assumed that even of transgender people. Turns out that's not true. <laughs> Just as there are people uh, that don't fall into that two box system in all other areas, um, there are plenty of trans people that don't fall into this two box system. So in recent studies that have been done on sort of trans and gender expansive communities, they found that about a third of folks are uh, trans men, a third of folks are trans women, and a third are what we sometimes talk about as non-binary folks. So a binary, of course, just means a two option system, like on off. Um, a non-binary person is someone who has a gender identity that doesn't conform to the male female binary. They may feel like a combination of male and female, or their gender might be beyond the binary altogether. Uh, we sometimes abbreviate this as NB, uh, and people will say um, NB as like a way to spell that out. So when we're thinking about non-binary identities, sometimes it can be a little hard for people to think about like, what does that even mean? What does that even look like to be uh, a non-binary person? And like I said, some people feel like a combination of male and female. So if you think about the fact that we always want to, um, you know, put people in either pink or blue boxes, you can imagine some non-binary people are kind of purple, right? They're kind of both of those things. Other non-binary folks, are like, actually, that system, the whole system doesn't work for me in my gender identity. So it would be like, we are saying everybody is either pink or blue, and a non-binary person is like, well, what if my gender identity is green? <laughs> I don't fit within that, like, whole system that is set up, right? So sometimes it can help to think about, like, colors as, a, as an example of, like, well, of course not all people in the world are either pink or blue. There's, like, a whole spectrum of, of colors to, uh, that are out there that aren't held within those two options. So sometimes non-binary is itself an umbrella term, too, <laughs> which is why I said in those um, trans studies that have been done recently, there's about a third who are trans men, a third who are trans women, and a third who are non-binary. Non-binary can also encompass tons of things because what it says is what it's not, right? Non-binary. So a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of different identities could be considered non-binary. So a couple of things that you might, uh, uh, a couple of words you might see come up. Um, you might meet a genderqueer person who is a person who might use this term to describe the complexity of their gender or to emphasize its personal or political nature. So for some genderqueer folks, they like to lean into the ambiguity of that word. The word queer is, of course, a word that, it, you know, has uh, this history as a slur. And for some people, it's still something that they're like not comfortable with and won't use for themselves. And that's totally fine. And there are other people who are like, I love the word queer. I love that it's ambiguous. I love that you have to get to know me to figure out what it means to me. Right. Um, uh, so for some people, um, a genderqueer identity is something that leans into that ambiguity. Sometimes it's um, a identity that um, 
you know, forces you to get to know the person uh, to find out what that means to them. You might meet a gender fluid person who is somebody who experiences their gender as something that changes over time and in different contexts. So for some gender fluid folks, it's, um, you know, something that changes in the day to day. You kind of wake up and you're like, <laughs> how do I understand my gender today? For other people, it changes over the course of years. Um, and so uh, gender fluidity is something that um I think everybody experiences some gender fluidity in our lives. We understand our gender differently when we're five than we do when we're 40, <laughs> you know? So there's some gender fluidity in everybody's life. But for gender fluid folks, people who take that identity or have that identity, um, it's something that maybe is a little bit more fluid than most. And then an agender person, if you meet somebody who's agender, they might not experience gender identity at all or at a lower level than others. So um, if you are familiar with um, uh, uh, the identity um, uh, or concept of asexuality, being asexual, meaning you don't have an attraction to other people sexually, or at least it's at a lower rate, agender is sort of the gender version of that. Um, so if you are a gender, you might not have a sense of your own gender identity at all. So these are all different, uh, sort of like common identities that you'll find within trans and gender expansive communities. There are plenty more than this. This is not all of them. So if you're like, wow, that's a lot, there's more. Um, but these are, uh, common ones that you'll sort of like run into in the day to day. And so it's kind of nice to know a little bit about them. Um, and when we think about what gender diversity looks like when we're talking about different kinds of trans and gender expansive folks. It doesn't look like any one thing. Um, these are all trans and gender expansive folks. Um, these are all folks who um, have experiences of their gender identity um, being different from their assigned sex. Alongside all of those terms that I just gave up there, uh, there are also culturally specific terms. So um, for instance, uh, uh, Folks in cultures that uh, have recognized genders outside of the male-female binary, that's like a common thing around the world. Um, and so like uh, there are Mahu people in Hawaii, there are the Mujes uh, people in Mexico, there are a whole bunch of different um, gender expansive identities within um, uh, native and uh, indigenous uh, communities and nations in North America. So here, you know, we're on the land of uh, the Lakota and the Ojibwe here in the Twin Cities region. Both the Lakota and the Ojibwe people have um, words and identities for folks that are outside of the male-female binary. So like, this is a common thing throughout the world. And if you're part of one of those particular cultures, you might have a specific word for that in your language. In English, when we're talking about trans folks, here are just a couple of general rules for uh, like how this how these words are used and how we uh, talk about them. Uh, transgender is an adjective; it's a descriptive word. So you would say somebody is a transgender person, not just a transgender, right? That would be using it like a noun. Um, so as a descriptive word, you also don't need to add an ed on the end of it for transgendered. Um, that was common. I don't know, um, 10 years ago or so, you would see it all over the place. There's been kind of a movement away from that as we've kind of like honed the language to make it make sense um, to folks. And it also uh, makes it sound like something terrible ha happened to you to make you trans. <laughs> to, you got hit by a bus and got transgendered. <laughs> so <laughs> we tend to not use that ED on the end of the word anymore. So terms to be careful with, uh, one is the word transsexual. So this is still sometimes used and preferred by some folks, um, but it has largely been replaced by transgender or just trans. So um, knowing that like all these words I'm giving you, these are all general rules. If you meet somebody who's like, I am this thing, don't tell them that they're not because you heard Austin say so, right? Like <laughs> they know best about their own identity, but these are some general guidelines. Um, and the phrase sex change, that was really common in, you know, like the news and sensationalist media. Um, that's not really the way we talk about trans folks and uh, changing gender expression, changing parts of our bodies or our social transition. Uh, we now talk about it as transitioning. Um, so somebody is uh, transitioning or making a gender transition. That would be the way that we would talk about it these days. Um, 
I I'll, very small thing that I'll say about transitioning, and that is that there are lots of different ways to transition, and not every trans person transitions. So there are ways to socially transition, changing things like um, your gender expression, changing your name or your pronouns, things like that. Um, there are ways to physically transition, like medically through uh, hormone replacement therapy or surgeries or things like that. Um, and there are ways to legally transition, like having to go through the whole rigmarole of changing all of your documents uh, uh, legally. So all of those things are different ways to transition. And not everybody transitions the same way. Not everybody transitions. Some people don't want to. Some people can't access transition, especially when it comes to different kinds of medical transition. It's very expensive. A lot of insurance won't cover it. Um, even insurance that will cover it, like for instance, um, I, I did some medical transition uh, back in 2014 um, before uh, the Affordable Care Act changed a little bit how insurance um, handles um, transition. But when I was transitioning back then, they I petitioned my insurance to cover this particular thing. And they, after a long fight, were like, OK, fine, we'll cover it. Uh, but it has to be somebody in network. Turned out there were no doctors in network that did this thing. So it's it's a difficult thing all the way around. And it's an expensive thing. And so not everybody can access different kinds of medical transition, especially. One more thing I'll say about transition, because this is very much a, uh, a mm, I was going to say a talking point. It's an it's a avenue of misinformation about trans folks, <laughs> which is that um, there are like little kids that are transitioning medically, and that is not a thing that's happening. There is no medical transition for kids prior to puberty at all. <laughs> Um, the only transition you might do before puberty, if you have a young child that has like this, uh, we talk about consistent, insistent, persistent uh, gender identity, um, they might socially transition. So they might, you know, get their hair cut and change the kind of clothes they wear and maybe change their name. That's about it. There's no medical transition for little kids. Um, the first time you could even consider any kind of medical transition is um, when you hit puberty, there are these things called puberty blockers that are um, medications that uh, your uh, doctor might prescribe to essentially hit pause on puberty. Um, and that way it gives the family more time to figure out what's going on with a kid. Um, it keeps the kid from going through their natal puberty that has irreversible effects. Um, so things like if you are um, assigned male at birth, things like your voice dropping, that's an irreversible thing. So sometimes they will prescribe puberty blockers to just put pause on that to give the kid more time to process what's going on. And then when you come off of puberty blockers, your natal puberty kicks back in again. So those are reversible. That's the only kind of thing that happens for um, uh, younger folks. Um, any kind of like surgery and things like that, you have to be 18 in almost every state. Sometimes they will allow for some things um, if you're 16 with both parents or guardians consent, um, but it's a really, really um, uncommon thing. So just knowing that if you've heard terrible things about little kids having surgery, that is not happening for trans kids. So why is trans allyship important? Why are we talking about this? First of all, because trans people are already part of our churches. Uh, I will sometimes go to churches and they'll say, well, we don't have any trans people here. And I'll say that you know of. <laughs> Um, there, uh, you may have trans people in your community you don't know of, uh, and it's fa in fact, statistically, it's likely. Um, so, um, there's somewhere between 1.4 million and 2 million trans folks in the United States. And according to the 2015 U.S. trans survey, 66% of trans folks said they had been involved with a faith community at some point in their life. 42% of those folks had been rejected by a faith community. Um, but they found a, or no, actually, it was more than that. The actual number that was experienced rejection was more around 50%. But about 42% of the folks that had experienced rejection uh, found a new faith community that welcomes them. So essentially what these statistics are telling us are, one, trans folks are growing up in our churches, even if they're not showing up there later. Uh, two, they're experiencing rejection in our churches. And so what do we do about that? And three, they are looking for new church homes. How can we make sure that this is a safe place to come to, right? 
Um, I think this statistic is a helpful one as well. Um, the Human Rights Campaign's 2012 report, where they surveyed more than 10,000 LGBT-identified youth between ages 13 and 17, and they asked them, is your faith community accepting of LGBT people in general? 35% said no, 15% said yes, and 52% said they didn't know. The reason that that statistic is important is because if your entire culture is telling you that LGBT people and Christians are like at war between each other and like Christians don't approve of LGBT people, if your whole culture is saying that, you will assume that that is true of your church unless your church says otherwise specifically. Um, so that 52% might as well be put in the no category because <laughs> if their church isn't talking about it, they assume that their church is not a place where they can talk about it. So that's why it's important for us to be like, to be talking about this stuff, to be visible as affirming churches, because if we don't talk about it, our youth assume that they can't. Another reason allyship is important is because lives are on the line. Um, I have done presentations on um, trans folks uh, to churches for since since 2014, um, and every single year I have to update this first sentence. 2021 was the deadliest year ever for trans people. It has been the deadliest year ever since 2014, every single year. At least 57 trans people were murdered in the U.S. last year, and more than 375 trans people were murdered worldwide. Almost all the people we have lost in the U.S. were trans women of color and specifically black trans women. So the intersection of race and gender um, is a really deadly mix when it comes to um, people just getting to live their lives. <laughs> and so we have to the reason that I bring this statistic up is to know, number one, um, uh, the world can be a dangerous place for trans folks a lot of the time. And number two, the fact that we know that um, black trans women and native trans women especially um, are at risk means that we know where we need to direct our resources first. So that's why it's important to talk about who is most at risk in this community. There's also um, a high suicide rate. So this statistic has been kind of debated over time and kind of moved back and forth, but around 41% of trans people attempt suicide in their life. Uh, and LGBTQ plus people who experience family rejection are twice as likely to attempt suicide, and religion is cited as one of the largest factors in family rejection. So what this is telling us is that there is a direct link between non-affirming faith communities to non-affirming families to suicidal uh, youth and, and young adults um, and adults as well. So that's like a really negative pipeline, but the good news is that there's also a positive connection there, that when you have affirming faith communities, it leads to affirming families, which then leads to better mental health outcomes. When we talk about that high suicide rate, we ask the question, why is the suicide rate so high? Like what's going on there? Basically what's happening is this thing called minority stress. So this is a, uh, a thing that happens to folks who live under uh, a experience uh, of a world that isn't built for them, basically. Um, so LGBTQ plus people often live with a continuous expectation of rejection and underlying current of fear because of the threat or of physical or emotional violence. And the constant stress can lead to depression, anxiety, substance use disorders, and suicidal thoughts and actions. So basically, if you live in a place where you are constantly under threat, it changes your brain chemistry. <laughs> and not necessarily for the better. Um, and so this is something that we know is a thing um, within LGBT communities. We know it's definitely a thing happening right now with a lot of anti-trans legislation happening all over the country. Calls to um, uh, suicide hotlines for trans folks have skyrocketed um, as we've seen the effect that that has had, especially on our youth. And we know that when an LGBTQ plus person holds another marginalized identity, the stress that they experience is compounded. So there was a 2003 study of American Indian and Alaskan Native adolescent men in Minnesota. It found that 47% of gay youth had considered suicide compared with only 23% of their straight peers. So if you hold more than one marginalized identity, you're getting that twice, essentially. Um, and so it's, again, important to know where we need to direct our resources.
So here's the good news. Like I said, there's that positive pipeline as well, and we can do things to change this. We can create affirming faith communities and affirming families. So here's a study uh, from the University of Texas at Austin uh, that talked to uh, trans youth ages 15 to 21 who had their chosen name used at school, work, home, and with friends. And they found that they had 71% fewer symptoms of severe depression, a 34% decrease in reported thoughts of suicide, a 65% decrease in suicide attempts. Having even one context in which a chosen name could be used was associated with a 29% decrease in suicidal thoughts. So this is why using somebody's right name and pronouns, which we'll talk about in a minute, is important. It is a visible, well, not visible, you're speaking. It is a tangible reminder that you are seen and loved and acknowledged and known in a space, that somebody cares about talking to you like you're actually there. <laughs> and that is a big deal. Um, so we've got this study that shows us these four contexts, right? And talks about how even one context makes a difference. The reason I bring this study to churches is to say, what if church was one of these contexts? What if church was the only place where everybody used your right name and pronouns, even if nobody ever did at school, your friends didn't do it, um, if nobody else did, what if church could be that one context? So this is a, a specific way that churches can be an actual sanctuary for trans folks. A 2016 study from the University of Washington showed that trans youth who were supported by their parents and allowed to socially transition had the same risk for depression as their cisgender peers and only a 2-4% to higher risk for anxiety. This is a big deal. We have done uh, more and more studies around this to look at folks who are supported in their identity. Turns out it's not just being trans that means that like you're somehow inherently more likely to have uh, uh, struggles with mental illness. It's if you're trans and you're not supported. <laughs> so when we have studies like this, it really backs up this minority stress model that says like, um, it's not something inherent to you that's like causing the problem. It's that you're living in a place um, that doesn't support you. Um, and so when we see studies like this, we know that it's possible to build communities where trans youth are supported um, and in which we don't have to um, see these sort of uh, high rates of um, mental illness with folks. So when we're talking about allyship and what allyship is, I often talk about how allyship, I talk more about allyship than I talk about being an ally because um, what it, it's an action. It's a thing you do. <laughs> um, the idea of like being an ally is good, but it's only good when it's backed up with action. So talking about allyship as something you do is important. It's a lifelong commitment to relationships, conversation, learning, accountability, and action. It's rejecting or diverting power you've been given in order to act in solidarity with the oppressed. And the great one of the great things about Christianity is we have a really great example of this baked directly into our theology. Um, in Philippians, you get one of the oldest parts of the New Testament, something called the Christ hymn that talks about Jesus. And it says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, rather emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. So one of the first things that was important to early Christians was this idea that God could have come down throwing thunderbolts, and instead God came down and was among humans as a human. That's an example of rejecting power in order to be in solidarity with a people. So like perfect example of what allyship looks like. God came down to be with us. Emmanuel is God with us. So that's a great example. So I talked about how names are important. Pronouns are also super important. So a pronoun, you know, basic grammar lesson here. Pronouns replace nouns when we re refer to somebody in the third person. So she loves armadillos or his shoelaces are untied. And for many languages, there aren't just two options for masculine and feminine language. There's also a gender neutral option. And in English, uh, in modern English, we don't have as many gender neutral options as some other languages do, but we're developing language and we're bringing back old language to help us do this better. So one of the ways we're doing that is by using they, them, and theirs as a gender neutral single pronoun. 
And sometimes when I talk to folks about this, especially if it's folks who are like, you know, English teachers, they're like, wait a minute, you can't do that. They, them, theirs, that's plural. That's not how that works. And there's a couple things we can say to that. First, um, as my friend uh, who's a pastor and does marriage counseling uh, will often say, would you rather be right or would you rather be in relationship? <laughs> Sometimes we are willing to bend grammar rules in order to show somebody that they are loved and appreciated and they belong in our space. So that's point number one. Second point is, um, this is actually not a totally new thing. We've been using they, them, theirs in singular places um, throughout English history. So a couple of examples uh, you can find in Shakespeare and in Jane Austen. There are a couple of examples of sentences using uh, there as a singular. Um, so there are examples of this that have happened in uh, English history. Uh, and third, third thing to think about is the way that it, language changes over time, right? Language is meant to communicate to other people. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we trying to communicate? Are we trying to communicate, I'm right and you're wrong? Or are we trying to communicate, I care about you? And the way that we change our language does that. Um, so when you think about how language changes, we should be um, aware. So there's they, them, theirs. There's also a whole bunch of other pronouns. Uh, and you might look at those and go, Ooh, actually, all right. Um, give me they, them, there. It's easier. <laughs> I, at least I know those pronouns. Um, but there are plenty other pronouns out there um, that have been sort of uh, uh, come up with in the past 30 years or so to try to give us some other gender neutral options. So we have Z and ve and fe. So there's lots of other options out there. Um, uh, the important thing is to work to learn the pronouns of the person you're talking to and the person that you care about. And one of the ways um, when I'm talking with folks that are trying to learn new pronouns for somebody, they'll often say, like, I'm trying, but it's just not sticking. And I'm not sure, like, why it's not sticking. Well, one of the important things to know about learning language is that you have to actually say a word with your mouth in order to remember it, <laughs> which is why we tell our little kids that they should say their flashcards out loud when they're trying to memorize flashcards, right? Same thing with pronouns. If you're trying to learn somebody's pronouns and they're, they're not familiar to you or it's just like you haven't connected them with this person yet, say them out loud to yourself when you're driving, when you're in the car, find a friend who's also trying to learn the new pronouns and talk about the person with each other. You have to say it with your mouth for your brain to create those neural pathways. So uh, just some example sentences here on using they, them as a singular pronoun. I think sometimes it's helpful to see what this looks like in practice. So um, I'm going to do a little call and response here and see if you can get the they, them, theirs pronouns here. Um, so let's use they, them pronouns and fill into the, into the sentences here. Let's try this. Did you take Amanda's toy? They need that back. Perfect. I was looking for Jess. Have you seen them? Perfect. I wish I could go to the dance with Sabine. They are so cool. Tyrone wants to do it themselves. So themselves or themselves. This is a weird thing that's evolving because you would think that it would be themselves for plural. And it's been um, sort of moving toward themselves as a as a singular word. Neither one is better than the other at this point. It's in, in transition, uh, as many things are. Oh, no, Taylor forgot their hat. Perfect. So practicing stuff like this can be really helpful as you just, like, get yourself to, to make those neural pathways in your brain. So a couple of examples of things to say and not say to folks. Uh, things you should not say. Have you had the surgery? <laughs> The first reason you wouldn't ask this is because there is no such thing as the surgery. Um, <laughs> there are all kinds of surgeries that trans folks may choose to get or not get. Um, there's no one surgery. Usually what people mean when they ask this question is, what's in your pants? <laughs> and that's just not a polite thing to ask anybody. So don't ask trans people. Um, what is your real name or what was your birth name? Now, of course, you wouldn't want to say, what's your real name? Because that assumes that the person that the you know, the name they just gave you isn't real. Um, but second, asking about somebody's birth name is not something you should do, not because they're trying to like hide anything, but because lots of trans people have a somewhat traumatic history with their birth name a lot of the time. 
Um, this is something for me that I have family members to this day who still use my birth name intentionally to make a point about how they don't support me being trans. So like when you have somebody use your birth name like a swear word, <laughs> it becomes kind of a traumatic thing over time. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to be talking to somebody in the middle of Starbucks and ask them what was your birth name and have them burst into tears. <laughs> so this is generally just not a good question to ask because you don't know what their history with their name is. I never would have guessed, or you look great for a trans person. Um, obviously, you wouldn't say, look, you look great for a trans person, because that assumes all trans people look bad. Um, or just that they all look one specific way. Um, a lot of the sort of um, backhanded compliments are meant really well, but it kind of puts this thing across of, like, trans people should look a certain way. You should be striving to look like this. You should be striving to to pass or, or look like other people. Um, and that's not what all trans people want to do. Um, so if you're, you know, complimenting somebody, um, you can say something like, wow, I really like your nice dress, or that's a great shirt, or, you know, I love your haircut, something like that, right? That doesn't assume that they're trying to fit into a specific gender mold. And then this is the thing in Minnesota, we're a little passive aggressive here. So sometimes <laughs> we like to put things onto somebody else. I'm fine with it, but gosh, I feel so bad for her grandma, <laughs> right? This is a common thing that people do to kind of say, like, I'm not really fine with it. <laughs> so being aware of, like, how we are um, essentially getting across the message that, like, this is a sad thing or a bad thing that people should be concerned or worried about. Um, so being careful about how we talk about that. Things you can ask. Number one, what's your name? You can ask that of anybody. Can you remind me of your pronouns? So asking people's pronouns can be a really great thing to make sure that you're using the right pronouns for them. The one caveat um, I would say is that you should be aware that you should always be aware of the context in which you're asking for somebody's pronouns. So if you and your friend uh, or you you're meeting somebody new at like a dark dive bar somewhere and you're like, hey, what are your pronouns? <laughs> Sometimes it might not be a safe environment for that person to be like, well, actually, I use they them pronouns. <laughs> like it might not be a safe space for them to tell you anything about themselves because trans people, like I said earlier, are at risk of some violence sometimes. Um, so be aware of that. If you're like in your church and everybody else is asking about pronouns and that it's like a safe place to do that, absolutely go ahead and ask to make sure you're using the right pronouns for somebody. Um, how can I support you with that? A great all, all uh, uh, overarching question. And then my favorite, is there a good resource you would recommend on that? So rather than asking a person that you meet about, you know, like, um, uh, you know, if it's something that's specific to them, obviously, uh, then maybe you want to get to be better friends with that person and like talk to them more about that over time. But if it's just like somebody's telling you about like, here's a thing trans people experience or here's a thing that's going on in the news lately and it's here's why it's wrong. Rather than saying, hey, can you sit down and spend your time educating me right here and right now? <laughs> you can say, is there a great book? Is there a movie? Is there a, a video I should watch? Uh, is there a news article that would be helpful for this? So... How do we interrupt negative conversation? Um, this is something that I think is especially important right now because there's a lot of misinformation about trans people flying around all over the place. So how do we um, interrupt things when they're kind of like getting out of hand? Um, so if it's a joke that somebody's telling and you would not believe how many jokes uh, can literally be boiled down to, look, there's a masculine person in a dress and that's the whole joke. <laughs> You'll notice it when you start looking for it. It's a thing that happens in our society all the time. Um, figure out, ask the person why the joke is funny. Um, sometimes that can lead them to thinking enough about it to realize it's kind of a jerk thing to say, right? So ask them to explain why it's funny. Um, you can stand up for others by just saying, hey, that's not okay. You can set a boundary by saying, I don't want to be around people who say stuff like that. You can remove yourself from the situation, right? you can offer an alternative. So that's not the best way to phrase that. What if we said blank instead? Um, so that can be like an example of, of somebody, you know, like, did you hear about so-and-so who's had a sex change recently? And you can be like, actually, I just learned recently that um, the, it, the language around it is transitioning now. So 
I would say that person's transitioning. So you can kind of insert that alternative. Um, helping people understand why what they're doing is wrong. So saying something like, I was reading an article yesterday about how that kind of language can affect people. So um, pointing to the actual fruit of what's happening. <laughs> um, the way that you're talking is leading to X thing happening. And then my favorite one, which is using yourself as a learning example. So I used to think that too, but then a trans friend told me blank, right? So a lot of times people are, you know, I, I think that sort of um, thing about don't ascribe to don't ascribe um, bad intentions to what could just be ignorance, right? I think a lot of people just don't know. And so saying like, well, actually, you know, I used to think that I used to have this idea and then I learned this and this is what changed my mind. It not only provides them with a piece of information that might change their mind, but it also shows that you were willing to change your mind first. And that gives somebody like a little bit more permission to change their mind too. So in a church context, um, there's lots of different ways to use more gender inclusive language. Um, sometimes we talk about, you know, our, our language about God um, shifts over time too, right? Um, so when we um, uh, use something like uh, language in liturgy, I think we've moved um, a bit away from using he, him for God only all the time. <laughs> and now sometimes we use some other pronouns too, or we maybe just say God, and then you get into like God, God self, which always sounds a little weird, but it's like, um, it, it, it is more accurate since God is sort of beyond gender or encompassing of all genders. So other ways that we might expand our language when we talk about God, um, uh, I never would say, don't do this. Like, don't, don't use he, him pronouns for God. I would never say that because for some people that's really connected to how they experience and understand God, but adding in some other alternatives can be really great. So things like moving from just using father, son, and Holy spirit to something like creator, redeemer, and sustainer, which comes from Augustine. Like that's an old way of talking about God that is non-gendered. Um, there are lots of non-gendered ways to talk about God. Language about our community. So does the gendered language we use to refer to others in our community actually reflect the diversity in our pews, in our pulpits, and in our Sunday school? So things like uh, talking about people as brothers and sisters might uh, isn't inclusive of folks that are non-binary. So um, just adding in siblings in places where you would normally say that something like brothers and sisters can be really helpful. Um, uh, siblings can be, you know, a standalone thing, our siblings in Christ, or you can say our brothers and sisters and siblings if you want to do everybody. Um, so thinking about how we use non-gendered language when we're talking to our congregation. The important reason for that is because people won't participate if they don't feel like they're supposed to be there. <laughs> and if you use language that sort of subtly gives people the hint that maybe they shouldn't be there or they shouldn't speak up, they're not going to get involved. They're not going to come back, right? And we want to make sure people are visible in our spaces. In music, um, we often organize by gender, right? This is the thing that happens all the time. Uh, men on stanza one, women on stanza two, right? One way to do this differently is to do low voices and high voices. So that way it's not a gendered thing. People can sing wherever their voice range is. And I have had so many women come up to me after I do this presentation and be like, oh yeah, I basically sing tenor and I'm so glad because it feels weird that like my, my femininity isn't recognized just because my voice is lower, right? So stuff like this um, is helpful for everybody. This isn't just for trans folks. Um, we also think about it in our language, in our hymns, right? Uh, so in the Chalice Hymnal, this was something that they changed. In uh, Be Thou My Vision, it used to be Thou My Great Father and I Thy True Son. And then they changed it because uh, they changed it to Thou My Redeemer, My Love, Thou Hast One, right? Part of the reason they did that was because a bunch of women in the congregation were like, this feels weird to be talking about myself as God's son when I'm not. <laughs> so gender expansive language is something that is helpful for everybody. In churches, we might be able to uh, put together some affirming liturgy or find affirming liturgy for different contexts. So liturgy for coming out or inviting in, reconciliation between family members, preparation for hormone therapy or surgery, 
uh, renaming. I had a renaming um, uh, uh, and remembrance of baptism with my church, and it was beautiful. Um, it's just such a nice thing to have your community recognize that. It was literally just like in the middle of a normal service, just like a regular baptism is, and it was great. Um, for Trans Day of Remembrance and for Trans Day of Visibility. So, some things you can do in your community. Um, find out about anti-trans legislation up in your city or state. So here in Minnesota, um, there are uh, two different things that have been proposed. One is a bathroom bill that basically tries to make sure that people use the bathroom associated with their assigned sex. And if you want me hanging out in the women's restroom, that'll be a little weird for me <laughs> and everyone else. <laughs> So there are bills like that that are up. There are also bills about um, trans youth in sports and which teams they're allowed to participate on um, and the sort of like weird testing that they want to do to try to prove who's allowed on which team that's really invasive. Both of those things are up in Minnesota legislature, but neither one of them is likely to pass given what we have currently, and especially because Governor Walls has said that he will veto that. So that's great news for now, but do keep it in mind because elections are coming up and that might not always be the case. So see where your legislators stand on um, trans folks uh, maybe uh, before voting. Connect with other trans or LGBTQ organizations in your area. So I'm going to have a slide on that real quick. Plan actions with organizations you're a part of. It is super easy for a church to essentially just have a bunch of cards outside the sanctuary area and have everybody just sign them on the way out to say, like, we're in support of um, protections for trans folks. Easy. Sign them, send them out. Donate money and other resources to trans-led organizations. And petition local organizations to include a welcome or protection for trans people. Um, and then finally, counter misinformation with facts and highlight trans voices. So this is something we definitely need right now is more uh, cis folks, more allies standing up and saying, hey, actually, that thing's not true about trans folks that you heard. Uh, and here's why. So there's lots of ways you can find information on that. Uh, one of the ways is by checking with these organizations. So these are all good places to know. Trans Lifeline is the um, major um, uh, suicide and crisis hotline for trans folks by trans folks. Gender Spectrum is a great organization that teaches about gender diversity and has support for trans youth. Uh, the National Center for Trans Equality and the ACLU have a lot of resources on legislation. And then in Minnesota, we have Outfront Minnesota, of course, which is our main LGBT advocacy organization. We have Gender Justice that does um, uh, legal work around support for all different kinds of gender diversity. And then Transforming Families, which is um, the family and youth support network for uh, trans youth. So finally, top seven affirming actions for churches. Include trans people in your church leadership. Don't allow for a, uh, a sort of rainbow glass ceiling in terms of who's leading. Educate your leaders and greeters. So make sure that your youth educators uh, like Alexandra and other folks have uh, some sense of this stuff for youth when they come out. Um, make sure that you have, if you have folks greeting people at the door, that they're not greeting people with the wrong name and pronouns. Um, create gender inclusive facilities. So things like all gender restrooms. Use inclusive language, have a welcoming statement and non-discrimination policy, redistribute resources to trans people through donations and partnerships with local support orgs, and then regularly including resources and theology related to gender diversity in preaching, Bible studies, and youth curricula. For individuals, you can educate yourself and keep, uh, keep educating yourself. It's a long, uh, lifelong thing. Start using inclusive language, practice interrupting negative conversation, be vocal about your support, get involved in policy change, offer to help gender expansive people navigate possibly unsafe spaces. So like I said earlier, that thing about bathrooms, sometimes if you're out at a dive bar with your trans friend, be like, hey, you want me to go check the bathroom before you go and make sure it's safe? Definitely a thing that is helpful sometimes. Uh, donate to organizations headed by gender expansive people. So... We are almost at time, but we got a little bit of time for questions. Um, if you want further resources on all of this, um, we've got the recommended reading list there, um, and Transmission Ministry Collective is the org I lead. We've got more resources on that website as well. Um, so yeah, 
I'll pass it over to you for questions. Thanks so much, Austin, for this generous presentation to the third of three. And if you missed one of the first ones, you can catch it on the live stream archive, the beauty of the live stream. Um, okay, so I'm sort of monitoring the chat here. I know some folks have joined us via live stream, um, but we've got time for a couple questions if anyone has something they'd like to ask. I have one in my head if we need, if we need me to, to vamp and tee one up. No, oh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> I don't, but I um, I'll, what I'm totally willing to do is send out these slides to folks if people would like to see these slides after the fact. Um, I don't know who the best person to send them to would be. Any one of us who you've been communicating okay. with would be great. But then cool. also you can see this presentation on the live stream archive and you can just True. pause it and, and take notes from there too. True, easy. yeah. So yeah. what I'll do is I'll email it to um to you and to sure. matt and to who is the other first megan person? megan yeah. yes <laughs> i will email it to the three of you and so if you email any of them they will send you the slides yeah yeah thanks did i see another hand yeah ronnie insistent <laughs> Yes, if you're if you are interested in uh, finding more about like trans youth and like how we figure out um, whether a, a young person is just sort of creative with their gender expression or whether they might actually be trans, um, there's a great book called The Transgender Child by um, uh, uh, Stephanie Brill and Lisa Kenny. Uh, they also wrote The Transgender Teen uh, as well. Both great resources that talk about like how do we help kids explore who they are and make sure we're supporting them without like assuming anything about them too early. <laughs> um, so yeah. Creative, uh, uh, insistent, persistent, and consistent are the three things that pediatricians look for when they're talking to trans youth. I love that. I wrote that down too, Ronnie. Yeah. Anyone else share a question? And I'm not seeing any on the live stream chat. That's okay. Sometimes <laughs> I know I talk fast and it takes a lot of time to sink in. <laughs> Well, I have one final question. I know that we'll lose the live stream at some point here mm. to transition to worship, but i um, curious if you have favorite fiction books, especially mm. like young adult. I read a really great one, um, Felix Ever After, which is oh, an yeah. awesome YA book mm. about that centers a trans experience. And I'm curious if you have other favorites. Gosh, I feel like, yeah, YA and children's books are getting so good right yeah. now. <laughs> There's um, a great one called Red, a Crayon Story. That's a great children's book. It's about a crayon who is blue, but somebody put a red wrapper on him. And so everybody keeps telling him he's red and he's really blue. Um, it's a really cute sort of analogy for being trans. Um, there's also a really great book that came out a couple of years ago called A Church for All. Um, that's a picture book for little kids and the whole book is like we're at church and look at all the different types of people and the different types of families and there's like trans folks and uh, all kinds of folks in the book and it's really nice to see kids it's in our children's in library yes yeah good it's a good one yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay did you have a question no okay cool <laughs> wonderful thanks so much austin yeah. for being here we're so grateful to you and thanks again you can me. catch the other two presentations on the archive so, awesome yeah thanks thank you <laughs>